Hey, what's up, how's it going? It's Rob, and in today's video, I have some recent rewilding news and stories. And that's what we do here at Leaf Curious. We explore rewilding, nature, and conservation. So if that's what you're into, consider subscribing. This bright red and sadly now dead chattering lorry was a resident at Chester Zoo for the past 28 years. They are a forest dwelling parrot species which are endemic to Meluku in Indonesia. Now I know in the picture he has passed away but please do not be completely disheartened because it's nature safe which have taken parts of his body and they are freezing him to one day be resurrected. At Nature Safe, which is the UK's largest biobank of living tissue, they're storing the cells at minus 196 degrees Celsius to one day when the species is extinct to be brought back to life. Okay, I know what you're thinking, how? Well, cloning animals is not new. Dolly the sheep was cloned back in 1996 after a cell from one ewe was combined with the egg of another. Traditionally being done for agriculture, it's only now that scientists believe it can be used in rewilding. In December 2020, US biotechnology company Revive and Restore helped create this little guy. Or should I say lady, Elizabeth Ann, an endangered black-footed ferret whose eggs were frozen back in 1988. A ferret fibroblast was fused with another cell creating an embryo and the clone was born. But you know, that's a very oversimplified and like general explanation of the process. Let me know if you want to get a more deeper video going into how this really works. But in the face of mass biodiversity loss today, having this as like a backup is really promising. But who do we freeze? Well, for the minute, Nature Safe is working with Chester Zoo and anytime a species dies, they take a sample. And this included a nine-year-old Jaguar Goshi who was found dead in her enclosure. It was a small piece of Goshi's ear which was taken for the deep freeze. Chester Zoo's doctor, Sue Wallacher, did state that it may be decades until we have the technology required to do exactly what we want with these samples. But if the samples aren't collected, then those genetics, those genes are lost forever. Golf courses occupy around 270,000 hectares in the UK. That's 2% of the total land area in the UK. We love golf here in the UK. Can't say I've ever played it very much, but we do love it. And although they appear green, they're not great for biodiversity. However, the Gillyflower Golf Course in Cornwall is trying to change that. So the golf course originally closed back in 2014, and since that time, all of the work and planning has been done to create a greener golf course that utilizes every square meter of space that isn't on the green allowing the rough to not only grow and flourish with wildflowers, but also to grow edibles. Apples for cider and cherries for liquor and tea trees, which are running parallel to the second hole. They're working with local food and drinks businesses to turn the guinea flowers crops into produce. Behind the project is Alex Smith and his father, Sir Tim Smith, founder of the Eden Project. So they're working to open an education center to host courses on horticulture cookery. However, this has been met by some animosity from the town's local residents, saying that in the planning phase, there was a general lack of consultation and that it will spoil precious views and it will suck business away from the town. In my opinion, you know, they're trying to boost the industry of horticulture and its many facets, which will ultimately feed into sustainable living. How many of you in the British countryside or wherever you are in the world, have seen a glowworm. So a few summers ago, I was on the walk back from the pub down some path, it's a really nice path, it's like trees and like fields all around. And I looked down the floor and there it was, a glowworm. I did have to do a double take over because I had had a few beers, but it was definitely a glowworm. It was my first and only. And it was probably my first and only because of the decline of our natural meadows and increasing light pollution. However, on the grounds of the Eltham Hotel in Hampshire, 500 glowworms have been bred in captivity and released to the, to the grounds. It's been led by the ecologist Derek Gow, who owns a rewilding farm and glamping site where more glowworms will be released this summer. You see, it's a female glowworm that actually glows that seeks to attract the flying males, but glowworms are notoriously bad at dispersing. And this coupled with the destruction of habitat and light pollution, it's made it hard for them to find one another. But thankfully, we have the ecologist Peter Cooper, who over the past couple of years has been honing his glowworm breeding skills, making sure that the larvae are well fed on snails and generally checked up on taking them to work in a cool bag. So from what I gathered, it's actually relatively easy to breed glowworms in captivity. And the ecologists who were working on this said, you know, there's no reason why this can't be something which happens in schools with school children across the country. And then hopefully one day, we'll see them widespread in the British countryside again. Oh, and as a side note, they are a gardener's best friend because they love to eat snails and slugs. I've got a massive problem with snails and slugs at the minute in the garden, so 
might have to get some glowworms going. So in our last video, we learned that beavers had recently been released to Enfield in London. The first beavers in the city for more than 400 years, which is just incredible. But now some new plans are being made to rewild the UK's capital. Plans look to develop cool rewilding areas in the outskirts of London, utilizing the River Thames and developing wetland hubs that would be home to beavers, as well as potential large herbivores. The project is seeking to use existing train lines between core areas as nature corridors, while also aiming to include and incorporate, you know, the wider community in London, get Londoners on board with this, because you know in cities there's just a lot of different landowners. So if everybody gets on board and reads from the same page, this will only increase the connectivity through the landscape. It's Ben Goldsmith who is in charge of this project, a financer and environmental campaigner on the board of DEFRA. Yeah, Rewilding London sounds incredible. It'll be really exciting to keep an eye on this one over the coming years. So in the UK, we have two very broad ways of managing the land for conservation. You have traditional conservation, and more recently you have the nature-led con conservation, such as rewilding which we know is all about allowing nature to take the lead. Like it's, it's about having minimal impact from humans to enable ecosystems to be self-regulating, you know? Whereas traditional conservation was, you know, more about the protection and maintenance of an ecosystem within a single state, often for a single species. And for many years until now, it has been traditional conservation that has protected our landscape and how we see it today. But we know that moving forward, this is not enough. So plans to create a super nature reserve in Somerset actively seeks to build on traditional conservation measures. So using rewilding, the idea is to knit together six separate but nearby nature reserves to a much more formidable 15,000 acre reserve. Linking together otter habitats in Glastonbury with street marshes, which is a crucial spot for many wetland birds here in the UK. Working with farmers and landowners in the adjoining areas to improve practices and to rewild waterways. So I think this approach of rewilding where we combine, you know, all of the pre-existing triple SIs and special areas of conservation, where we identify where, where these are, and then we look at the land in between them, and then we think, how can we boost the connectivity between these areas. You know, it's working with what we already have here in, in the UK, and it's a way of working with landowners and saying, look, I don't expect you to convert all of your land to rewilding. You know, you have to release animals and links and just stop farming altogether. It's about looking at ways to sympathetically increase the, the connectivity of the landscape because we know that rewilding can happen anywhere. It can happen on any scale, but it's most effective when it happens across large areas. If you enjoy this video, please like it and drop a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts and opinions. And if you have any questions on rewilding, I always love having a discussion with you down in the comments. If you want more from Live Curious, then you can get that over on Patreon, which is on the screen now. If you want to continue watching videos here on YouTube, then you can watch this one that's on the screen now. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching Live Curious.